Hey, what's up, everybody? Doran Aldana coming at you with another kick-ass episode of the Art of Mortgage Marketing podcast. And today we're going to talk about something that I have a feeling might be just a little bit, just a wee bit relevant to a few of you. And that is how to solve any problem in your mortgage business. Now, I know right now most of you are cool as a cucumber. You're kicking ass, you're taking names, you're chewing bubble gum, you're crushing it. You got no problems whatsoever in your business. But you can imagine that occasionally, once in a blue moon, you might encounter the odd problem, maybe just a small little problem occasionally, right? But certainly in this market that we're facing right now with hyper competition, margin compression, everyone and their dog chasing after the same filters rising rates, a lot of people getting priced out of the market. And with all the you know shit hitting the proverbial fan right now with the current market shift, I can imagine there might be a slight chance that more than a few of you are facing some challenges right now. And therein lies the reason why we're covering this topic on how to build that muscle of not just solving problems, but doing it with grace, not with grease, although we might need to grease some joints and grease some of the chains that you're currently using to use as machinery to build your business and to solve those problems. We may need some grease, but I want to also help you with the grace, poise, power, and proficiency be able to solve these problems that you're facing. Because it's not a matter of if we're going to have problems. It's just a matter of how many when and how big, right? Challenges, problems, that's the fiber and fabric of life. If you don't have any problems, you're probably not paying a, playing a big enough game or you're probably dead, one or the other, right? So problems are certainly a key part of what it looks like to take on big goals, big dreams, and big outcomes that you wanna achieve in your business. We're gonna have problems on the way to success. That's just the way it is. If you want to be the heavyweight champion of the world in the boxing ring, you're going to get punched in the freaking face. That's just par for the course, right? So it's not a matter of if you're going to get punched. It's just a matter of how many times and how hard. And the goal is to be able to take, take those problems, those challenges, and to use them to propel you higher. So instead of those problems hammering you against the rocks in life, you're able to use them to propel you closer and faster and more powerfully towards Paradise Island. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, how to solve any and all of those problems in your business and to do it with grace, with poise, with power, and even with peace. I know that's probably hard to imagine. You kidding me, Dorn? Challenges, problems, what do those have anything to do with peace? Well, by the end of today's training, at the end of today's session, I have a feeling you're going to be just that much closer to the awareness and the perspective necessary to do exactly that. So I want to share three principles, three principles for becoming a problem solver, a powerful problem solver. The first of those three principles is to accept the fact that you're going to have problems. The bigger your goals, the bigger your problems. So instead of resisting it, embrace it. You see, solving problems is what we do as mortgage professionals, right? That's what you get paid for, to solve people, people's problems when it comes to how to get money to buy a property or how to get money to keep a property or how to get money to buy an investment property. All of those are problems that you help people solve. How to get money if someone is you know, equity rich, but cash poor. That's a problem you solve. How to get money when they don't have access to the capital, but they have it tied up in the equity of their property. You help them solve those problems. And when it comes to your partners, your goal should be to help them solve problems in their business, help them grow their business more than just offering great rates, great service, throw me a bone and send me your deals. That's the loan leech mortgage parasite perspective. And most of your competitors, that's what they do. They just come to get, they don't come to give. They just come to leech loans instead of adding real unique, compelling value. But if you can help them solve problems 
that the average Joe LO doesn't solve or would not solve, that puts you in a category of one that has you be a welcome guest instead of an annoying pest. So solving problems is what we do as mortgage professionals, as business owners. Your ability to solve those problems is the reason why clients hire you and why partners partner with you. Your ability to solve problems. So there's often a misconception out there that, you know, if I sit in the lotus position and I do my incantations and my mantras and I get dialed in on the frequency of success with my law of attraction, you know, mind tricks that I should not have any problems. So it's just all lollipops, unicorns, rainbows, sunny skies, and everything's just going to flow into my life with effortless effort. But if you hadn't noticed by now, that's just not how it works, right? Even with all of the mindset stuff, you're still going to face challenges. You're still going to have turbulence. You're still going to have, you know, things that show up that thwart your progress, friction points. So what if those problems, instead of them being a sign that things aren't working and that, you know, it wasn't quote unquote meant to be, what if those problems were just a sign that you're on the right track? Because if you don't have problems, you're not playing a big enough game. What if those problems are a sign that you're stepping out of your comfort zone and all progress is outside of your comfort zone? You're building new muscle, right? It's like saying when you go to the gym, oh man, I'm sore as hell. I wasn't meant to go to the gym. This isn't working. You know, Maybe I'm not meant to be fit because I'm sore as hell. No, of course, you would not say that because you know without any pain, without any strain, there is no gain. That the fact you're sore means that you put yourself in a position to grow because you created little micro tears in your muscle fibers because you worked them to the point of failure such that now they're growing. Now they're rebuilding. Now you're getting stronger, right? So those problems aren't a sign that you're doing things wrong per se, although they could indicate that there's an opportunity to get better, sharper, wiser, put policy, procedure, protocol systems in place to improve your business, put better people in place to improve your business. So there's certainly going to be some alarm bells, alerts that are going to point us to what we need to work on and what we need to improve. But the fact that you're facing challenges and problems doesn't mean there's anything wrong. That means you're on the right track. That means you're going after bigger goals. That means you're striving to go higher in your business and in your life and in the impact you want to create in the world, in the marketplace. So embrace that as the new normal for you versus resisting it. Problems are an essential part of building our business and achieving our dreams. Without those problems, it's like trying to build muscle with no weight resistance. How well do you think that's going to work? If you didn't have weight resistance in the gym, if you didn't have that perspiration that produced the accretion of new muscle gain, you would not be able to get stronger and fitter in your body because it's that resistance that creates stronger muscles. And the same thing goes with our business. At the time, though, it's not easy to feel that, right? At the time, when a problem shows up for me, oftentimes my knee-jerk reaction is, oh, shit, right? Who wants a problem? That sucks. That's not what I wanted. That's not what I signed up for. This is not what I was hoping for. So let's get real. On the front lines of being human, we resist it because that's part of being human. So don't beat yourself up for that. That's part of being human. But we want to shift out of that resistance as quickly as possible because it's not a matter of if we are going to have problems. It's just a matter of when and how big. The more we resist those problems as they show up in our life, on our journey, the more we cause unnecessary suffering and the more we actually castrate and limit our ability to solve those problems. So it's important for us to mitigate the resistance because what we resist persists. So it's important that we embrace it as a challenge that brings out our best versus an unwanted pesky problem that we resist and it creates this friction in our soul. It creates unnecessary suffering of fear, anxiety, worry, uh, sleepless nights. We get bitter, we get frustrated, we get angry. 
And that's no fun to live in for ourselves. And it's really not helpful in solving the problems. If you hadn't noticed by now, true or not true, right? So here's another thing that I want to highlight is if indeed problems are baked into our existence, into the fiber and fabric of our reality as human beings, why do we resist it so much? Why don't we just embrace it and start to build an identity around it that we are badass problem solvers? It's like birds fly, fish swim, and we are badass problem solvers. That's who we are. We eat problems for breakfast all day, every day, and turn them into opportunities. That's how champions roll. What if that was your identity? What if that's how you see problems? Something tells me you embrace that identity. It's going to change everything for you. So that's the first principle that I want you to embrace. The fact that problems will always be there. So let's embrace them. Let's accept them. Let's leverage them. Let's use them. The second principle I want you to embrace is to take extreme ownership. Extreme ownership. There's a great book by the name of Jocko Willink called Ex Extreme Ownership. And he was a Navy SEAL commander. And if you don't know, Navy SEALs are like the elite of the elite of operators in the military, special forces. They took out Osama bin Laden. They do all the most dangerous operations. They're exceedingly highly trained and they have high stakes missions. Pretty much every time they lace up the boots, it's high stakes. It's very dangerous going against the most dangerous people on the planet. And so Jocko was a leader for these teams. And so he realized going through that experience of high stakes operations with these Navy SEAL teams, that there's a principle at play for success that's mission critical to success. And that's adopting a mindset, a leadership principle of extreme ownership. And that means when the shit hits the proverbial fan and things go sideways, when something happens in the mission where things unfold the way it's not supposed to unfold and there's very high stakes of someone getting killed, he does not have the luxury of blaming, of pointing fingers, of saying, you should have done this, you should have done that. He takes extreme ownership of that because he's the leader. And so he writes a book about how important it is to apply that same leadership principle to your business, to your life. If you want to have elite level leadership, you need to apply extreme ownership. So here's the powerful perspective I want you to consider embracing. Every failure in your business is a failure in your leadership. So if something goes south in your business, you don't point fingers, you don't blame shift, you don't look for something outside of yourself to blame. You look at yourself, you look at your leadership and you say, where did my leadership fall short? What did I not do? What did I neglect to do? What was supposed to be done that wasn't done? What kind of system, policy, procedure, protocol, or team member should have been in place or should have done a certain thing that was not done such that we dropped the ball on this. Notice it's about taking extreme ownership because here's the thing. If the problem is in your control, you have the power to change it. But if the problem is outside of your control because you're blaming something else or someone else, then you have no power to change it, do you? So, while a lot of people have a hard time embracing extreme ownership because let's be let's be real if i look at my own journey i had this imposter syndrome this feeling of inadequacy so if i was to look at myself and say oh this dropped the ball because i dropped the ball this failed because i failed if i looked at it like that i felt very insecure so it would or salt on the wound of my own insecurity. And this is why we're so prone not to embrace extreme ownership because we're afraid of feeling like a failure and looking like a failure. But in truth, if we stop looking at failure as a person, as an identity, and we shift it to simply just feedback, there is no failure, just feedback, just another opportunity to start again more intelligently, then it's not about us being a failure. It's about getting feedback on what did not work. 
It's like Thomas Edison, right? How did he create the incandescent light bulb? He didn't fail 10,000 times. He said he found 10,000 ways not to create the incandescent light bulb. So he did not see it as failure. He saw it as feedback. Another opportunity to start again more intelligently. So that's extreme ownership where it's like, hey, I'm learning, I'm growing. I give myself grace in the failure, but I also take ownership and responsibility for that failure. And your goal should be to build a culture, starting with you, leading from the top, because everything rises and falls on leadership. So the, your goal should be to build a culture in your company, in your team. If you're the team of one, the lone soldier, chief cook and bottle washer, then this is a great place to start because you'll never be able to build a team with this culture, with this mindset, with this principle until you own it for yourself, until you adopt it and lead by example for yourself. So this is a great time and place to start to apply this to yourself and your own operations. But the goal should be, as you build your team, to build a culture with your whole company, your whole team starts to adopt and embrace this principle of extreme ownership. So instead of everyone blaming and pointing fingers and saying, oh, it failed because of so-and-so, or it failed because this person didn't do that, or it failed because that person neglected to do this. Instead, everyone is embracing extreme ownership and say, oh, it failed because I didn't do this, or it failed because I neglected to do that, or it failed because we need to put this policy and procedure and protocol in place, and I didn't think to put that in there. So I take responsibility for that because I'm in charge of my domain. Notice the difference in the culture of a community of people, a team of people that are on a common mission to achieve outcomes, and they're all taking extreme ownership. That's inspiring, right? When's the last time you've ever seen a culture like that, right? Something tells me you've never experienced it. If you have, you are one fortunate soul because it's exceedingly rare. So that's principle two. Let's move on to principle three. Principle three is C every problem as a gift. See, every problem is a gift. Now, again, welcome to being human if that's not your first knee-jerk reaction to problems, right? If you're anything like me, that's the last thing you think and feel when a problem shows up, right? Oh, I can't wait. What a gift. I can't wait. It's like Christmas morning. No, that's generally not how it works, right? So give yourself grace if that's not your first reaction. But the goal is to shift out of that energy of feeling like a victim and feeling disgruntled or discouraged or annoyed or angry or frustrated or fearful or anxious, because you're going to feel that that's just being human. But then we don't want to stay there. We don't want to anchor that as our emotional home. We don't want to live there. So the goal is to shift out of that victim feeling and that victim mentality and to shift into the victor feeling, the victor mentality. And the way we do that is First of all, we realize that, hey, staying in that emotional turmoil is not serving to the solution. It's not helping to fix the problem. So we realize that we need to build this ability to get resourceful and to shift into resourcefulness as a muscle that we need to build. You build it by putting in the reps. You build it by being intentional about getting stronger in this area, from pivoting from drama and trauma and contraction in fear into faith, into power, into poise, into resourcefulness, into getting creative and innovative in finding solutions to the problem because you have an identity that every problem you face is overcomable. You have an identity that you have the ability to solve any problem that comes your way. That's who you are. So you have adopted and created inside of your own identity this knowing that you can solve any problem that might be thrown your way, no matter how big, no matter if it's something you've never encountered before, you have built that muscle by being intentional about being resourceful in the face of any challenge all day, every day. And the more you're intentional about flexing that muscle and putting in those reps, the more you're going to build that identity. Does that make sense? So here's the big idea behind this principle. The more resourceful you feel, the better you are at solving the problems. So if you feel peace, if you feel a sense of confidence, if you feel a sense of certainty, if you have a 
feeling of positive expectation, if you have a feeling of resourcefulness, if you have a feeling of, hey, I got this, you're much more likely to solve the problem than, oh shit, sky's falling. My life and my business is going to hell in a handbasket. My life sucks. Why does this happen to me? Why me? Why does life have to be so hard? Why can't it be easy? Notice the difference energetically, right? One's in expansion mode. The other one's in contraction mode. One's in victor mode. The other one's in victim mode. So meaning always, always follows emotion or rather emotion always follows meaning. Emotion is energy in motion. It always, always follows, easy for me to say, always follows the meaning that we give our circumstances. So if we have a meaning that's disempowering, guess what? We're going to have a disempowering emotion. If we have a meaning that's empowering, that has us stand with our shoulders back, with our cape on, breathing deeply with a relaxed smile on our face, and we have a meaning that empowers us like, hey, I got this. This is another opportunity to get stronger, sharper, wiser. This is going to propel us higher. That solving this problem is going to help me become the leader I need to be to fulfill my purpose, to fulfill my calling, to step into prosperity. When we choose an empowering meaning, naturally, emotion follows that meaning. And we're going to have an empowering emotion. You with me on that? So that's why we want to choose purposefully and intentionally to see every problem as a gift. It's like the sand inside of an oyster. Sand in an oyster is aggravating. It's painful. It rubs against that soft flesh and it causes pain. Now we could focus on that pain and we could feel like it's just a reason to complain and gripe and we can complain about that problem. We can focus on that problem. We can focus on that pain and we can feel like a victim that we got sand in our flesh. This sucks. Or we can focus on the pearl that it's producing in us because without the pain, there is no pearl. It's like the lump of coal underground, right? Without the pressure, there is no diamonds. Without the pain, there is no pearl. So shift your perspective from the pain to the pearl. From the worthless lump of coal under pressure, it just sucks. All that pressure, I don't need all this pressure, to it's bringing out the diamonds in my soul. It's making me into a gleaming, beaming diamond. You see, every adversity holds the seed of equal or greater opportunity. Napoleon Hill said that, think and grow rich. Every adversity holds the seed of equal or greater opportunity. The problem is, even when we know that, we forget it as soon as the problem hits, right? It's like, I know that to be true in my head, but in my heart, when the problem hits, that's like, I completely forget. I've got principle amnesia. All those principles, they're gonzo. And I'm, now all of a sudden, I'm in freak out mode, right? So that's part of being human. The key, though, is to shift back into faith, back into power, back into peace, back into resourcefulness as quickly as possible so that we can solve these problems with the least amount of emotional turmoil as possible. You see, because in the gym, if we come back to the gym metaphor, Gym metaphors work for almost everything, right? It's like, where does the gym metaphor not work? It works for everything. And it certainly works for this to tie in the principle that without hitting the point of failure, when we're lifting those weights that are heavier than what we're comfortable with, it's more than what we are comfortable lifting. It causes our muscle to go, go to the point of what? To go to the point of failure. Without hitting that point of failure, we could not build muscle. So it's the point of failure that produces that muscle. And guess what it feels like when we're at that point of failure? It's a grind, right? It's lactic acid buildup. It's that pain and that strain. But guess what? It leads to the gain. No pain, no strain, no gain. So now that we've talked about the three principles, let's talk about the three-part strategy for problem solving in your mortgage business. Okay, we got a three-part strategy. There's three elements to this. It's a three-prong approach. And I have learned that 
learned this system from my mentors and I'm passing this on to you. And I trust you'll find it useful and valuable as a matrix, as a tool in your toolbox to be able to apply this to any problem you might be solving, whether that it be a lead generation problem, an operations problem, a cash flow problem, a lead conversion problem, whether it be a pipeline problem, not enough commissions in my bank account problem, whatever it might be, you're going to be able to filter the matrix through this system that I'm about to share with you. You're going to filter the problems that you're facing through this three-part matrix to be able to apply the right solution to whatever you are facing and to be able to do it with power, poise, and peace. So the first of the three steps, actually, let me break down the three steps real quick. It's product, process, and people. So it's a three-step matrix to solving any problem. It's either a problem that is linked to your product, and I'll unpack what I mean by that as a mortgage professional that could be misconstrued. So I'll unpack that for you. But the first part of that is the product. It's a problem linked to your product. It's a problem linked to your process, or it's a problem linked to your people, or maybe a combination of all three. So let's unpack this. The first problem type of problem that you might be facing right now is a problem linked to the product. Now, when we talk product, there's a lots of different ways you can interpret that. It could be your loan products, or it could be the particular components that make up your service. And who's the end user of your service? It's either your client and or your partner, right? Because if you're looking to attract more partners, like referral partners, like realtors, for example, they need to be seen as a client, an end user that you're serving. It's not just your client, the borrower, it's also your partners. So you have two different types of people you're serving, clients and partners. And for both of those, your product is there to serve them to outcomes. Either you're helping the borrower get into a home of their own, get out of the suck of making their landlord rich, getting into the dream and the glory of home ownership. Or maybe it's helping your partners grow their business, working smarter, not harder, convert more of their dead leads into hot for what you got leads, put more zeros and commas in their bank account, uh, grow their business while working less hours, grow their income while working less hours with less stress. There's outcomes that you're producing for your borrowers, for your clients, and for your partners. The question is, is your service delivering the value as promised? getting them to those outcomes. If it's not getting them to those outcomes, then we have a problem with the product. Now, truth be told, as a mortgage professional, with you being the one who's got feet in the street, who's the personality behind everything that you do, in truth, you first and foremost are the product, right? You are the product. Your personality, your leadership, your strategy, your guidance, all of that is inextricably linked with you and the best way to deliver the best outcome to your clients and to your partners is for you to show up as the best version of yourself. So if you're not getting enough sleep, if you're overweight, lethargic, if you're not feeling good in your body, if you have no energy, if you're feeling sick, if you're feeling demoralized, if you're having marital issues and that's causing all kinds of emotional turmoil, if you're you know, coping by drinking or smoking or you're staying up late watching Netflix, uh, all these sorts of things impact the product, which is you, your rhythms, your routines, right? Because if you have champion level ambitions, but chump level habits, we got a problem, right? That's not going to bode well. So we need to align your rhythms, your habits, and everything that you bring to your product, which is you to deliver the best outcome to your clients and to your partners. So that's the first thing you want to look at is, is the problem linked to anything that you are bringing to the table when it comes to your rituals, your routines, your habits? Is it linked to anything that you're doing when it comes to your leadership, your strategy, your guidance? If it is, then we may have a product issue. Now, there also may be issues with the product as it relates to 
you know, having the wrong product for the specific niche. Like if you're going after uh, people that are very affluent and you do not have a competitive product when it comes to jumbo loans for the affluent, we've got a problem with the product, right? That's not going to work because they're not going to want to pay overpay for something that they can get elsewhere for a fraction of the cost. So that again is a product issue. Okay. So that's that. That's one area you want to look at when it comes to solving your problems. The next area you want to look at is a problem of process, a problem of process. So do you have a process for that problem? That's the first thing you want to ask yourself when you encounter a problem. Do I have a process to help mitigate, if not eliminate this in the future? If you're first starting out, chances are you don't have any processes. You're starting from scratch and you're kind of just throwing yogurt to the fan, hoping something sticks and you don't really have a process for any of the stuff because you didn't really even realize you need a process until you encounter the problem. One of the benefits, of course, of having a mentor in your corner and certainly a big reason why smart, ambitious, growth-minded mortgage bros hire us is so that they can have a swipe and deploy library of tools, systems, campaigns, policy, procedure, protocol to be able to utilize and leverage without having to reinvent the wheel and trying to take all that time, energy, and hassle of trying to figure it out on your own. So creating these processes is time consuming, especially considering there's a million and one ways to make that process not work. And usually only one or two different ways to make it work. And there's really only one way to take the shortest path to the cash. So that's not an easy thing to crack the code on. You can't just Google search it, right? But that's the sort of thing you want to ask yourself when you encounter a problem, whatever problem you may be facing right now, what's the process? Do I have a process for this? Is this linked to a break in my process? And do I, what do I need to do to improve my process? Or what process do I need to put in place to fill that hole? Is there a hole in my process that I need to fill? So a big question you want to ask yourself when you realize that maybe this is linked to a break in your process or a hole in your process is what went wrong and what process can be put in place to prevent it in the future. So it's like an algorithm, right? If this happens in my business, then I need to put this policy procedure protocol in place. If this happens, then this. So it's an algorithm. It's a rule or a policy or a procedure that you need to put in place. And ideally, you don't want to just have it in your head. You want to have it written down on a Google document or some kind of an operations manual so that you actually have a systems-based business versus just a you-based business. Because as you build your team, if you're training your team and you're just basically showing up and throwing up and giving a data dump of what to do and you don't have it written down with policy procedure protocol systems and have it delineated clearly in writing, the chance of them remembering that is slim to none, right? So that's why we need that if this, then that protocol written down so it's lucid, so it's crystal clear. Does that make sense? So once we have that policy procedure protocol, then we want to ask, does everyone know what the policy procedure protocol is and do they know their role inside of it? Have they been properly trained? If indeed they've been properly trained, then we need to look at maybe it's the wrong person. We'll talk about that in a moment. But if they haven't been properly trained with you being the leader, guess who that's on? That's on you, right? If you haven't properly trained them, that's on you as the leader. Remember, that's extreme ownership not to beat yourself up, but to take responsibility for what you have control over. The buck stops here, right? So then you want to ask, is there a way to improve the process? Is there holes in the process that we need to fill? So rather than reacting by blaming or blame shifting or pointing fingers, always start by assuming that the problem is linked to a problem with the process. So what that's going to do, it's going to create a safe place in your leadership. So instead of pounding your people over the head with a two by four saying, hey, you should have done this. You should have been done that. You know, and by the way, I've often felt like doing that. I, in the beginning of my career, I did that where I'd lash out and I beat my people up 
And I was not a nice person to work for because I would just blame them. And I would not take ownership of the fact that I would, did not train them properly. I didn't have policy procedure protocol in place for them. I did not give them the checklist and the tools. I did not properly train them and certify and verify that they actually knew their job. But of course, at the time, I didn't know that, right? So I just pointed fingers at them and lashed out. How many times do I have to tell you? I feel like a broken record, right? Sound familiar? So any of you who have uh, teams, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's a very common plight. So instead of pointing fingers, we want to look at ourselves and we also want to look at our policy and procedures and systems and to make sure we're properly training our people. Let's be real. Processes, policy, procedure protocol, it's not exactly the sexiest part of our business, is it? Especially when we're going Mach 10 with our hair on fire and I don't have much hair to spare. So that's saying something, right? When we are in that like do mode, the last thing we want to do is take two times longer, three times longer to type out the policy or to create a FAQ document or to create a policy document or a process document, right? We just want to get to it and do it. We just want to delegate it. We just want to get it off our plate. But if it will take two times longer, to really nail down the process, then we have 10 times more freedom in the future because now our people can run your business. Our people can run our business like a finely old machine in our absence. So we can be sitting poolside with the Mai Tai in hand, in the you know Bahamas, in our pajamas, living the dream life, the freedom life, while the business is running like a finely old machine in our absence. So let's get real. These processes and procedures, they're not sexy, but if you'll do these things that you don't want to do when you want to do them, there'll come a time when you can do the things you want to do when you want to do them. You'll step into a whole other level of freedom. And that's the whole idea behind having these processes in place. So get processes out of your head and into some kind of operations manual. So your business runs without you. That's where true freedom lies, friends, by getting it out of your head. Because if it's in your head and that's the only place it is, you're dead. If you have a great process, but you're still not getting the results, the outcomes you want, you're still facing these pesky problems, then maybe you have an issue with the third P, which is people, a people problem. So this is where you want to ask yourself, is this a problem of training or is it a problem of temperament? Is it a problem of training or temperament? Because if they're a top talent person, but they're in the wrong role, then they're going to struggle in that role. But if you haven't trained them properly, they're going to struggle because you haven't trained them properly. So we need to diagnose that. Do they know what the proper policy procedure protocol is. Have they been properly trained? Have you verified that they know how to do the role properly? Have you checked up on them? Do you have the right person in the right seats in your bus, so to speak? You think about your business, your team as a bus with multiple seats. You want to make sure you have the right people with the right butts in the right seats which means that they're operating in their superpower. They're operating in their zone of genius. They're operating in their strengths, not their weaknesses. Because if it's because they're, if there's a problem and that problem has happened because you realize that you've given them the right policy, the right training, the right process, they're clear on what needs to be done, but they're falling short. It's probably because they have the wrong temperament which means you're trying to get a bear to fly, right? You're trying to get someone who doesn't know how to do something to do it because it's not their gift. It's not their zone of genius. They're unsuited for the role. So we want to get everyone operating in their superpowers. That's the goal. We want to build a top talent team and have everyone operating in their superpowers. So the administrative role needs to have someone who has a gift in administration. The sales role has someone who has a gift in sales, in building rapport, in influence. Someone who is in a leadership role, they have a gift in influence, in leadership, in persuasion, in 
getting their ideas and getting the vision and the mission behind what they're wanting to accomplish across and connecting with other people's hearts and minds to influence people's behavior, to influence their performance. Notice there's a gift there. It's not just a trained skill. It's a natural proclivity they're God-given and God-equipped with. And so you want to make sure you have everyone operating in those superpowers. And if they're not, and you don't have a, ro a role for that particular person's superpower, because where they are weak, you're getting them to try and be unique. And that doesn't work, right? Because that, you know, you're not going to be able to get them to switch into superpower mode when that's never been their superpower and it'll never be their super superpower. You will go an entire lifetime trying to train someone like that. If they're bad at technology, they'll probably always be bad at technology. If they're bad at sales, they'll probably always be bad at sales because again, there's natural giftings that they either have or don't have. You can't just pop a pill and give people the gift of technology. If they have that gift, they're going to have it. If they don't, Chances are they won't. So if you find that the problem is linked to having the wrong person in the wrong seat of the bus and you don't have another seat to move them to, that's where you need to bless them and release them. And the problem we have with that so often is we don't want to have those hard conversations, right? We don't want to have that uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversation. We don't want to, you know, release someone because, you know, we feel sorry for them to have them go through all the time and energy of getting trained and all this. And now we feel like we're letting them down, but in truth, we're letting, we're letting them down by enabling mediocrity. We're letting them down to allow them to stay in that role. That's having them be mediocre and perpetuating mediocrity is not serving them. And it's certainly not serving you. So if you're having problems in your business, whether it be people problems, leadership problems, uh, lead generation problems, lead conversion problems, attracting partners, trying to get top producing realtors on board, but they're not giving me the time of day, trying to get more quality leads in the door, but you're finding that it's just like a slow grind up the mountain. If you're finding that you're having problems in your business, you don't know how to solve them. We want to help you at mortgagemarketingcoach.com. We've been helping mortgage professionals create breakthroughs and solve problems in their business for almost 18 years. It's not our first rodeo. And so regardless of what problems you may be facing right now, chances are we have a battle-tested, proven system, policy, procedure, protocol, or program to help solve that problem. In other words, rather than having to reinvent the wheel and inflict yourself with all the time and drama and trauma and drudgery of trying to reinvent the wheel... You can just grab the key, stick it in the ignition and drive away with an operational system. We can spoon feed you from a silver spoon, from a silver platter, all the best, most effective proven systems from what it takes to attract top producing realtors to make you their exclusive without the hell of cold calling, I might add. What it takes to mine the gold from your database to maximize repeat and referral business and what systems you need in place to be able to do that. All the campaigns, all the words that work, all the technology, the whole enchilada. So if you're in a place where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired of bumping up against your leadership lid, not knowing how to solve these problems in your business, and you're ready to condense decades into days by modeling someone else's proven formula. So instead of you trying to figure it out on your own, you can just get the recipe the blueprint, the formula, and go straight to what works. And you're ready to take your business to the next level and not just thrive in a lollipops, unicorns, rainbows, sunny skies, fair weather environment like we had over the last few years with crazy low rates. But you want to learn the formula to thrive in any market, including this one. Then I invite you to book a complimentary breakthrough call. You need to be a 100% commission mortgage professional with a 70 basis points or higher comp plan. And you need to have an ambition to want to add at least $100,000 or more to your annual income while working smarter, not harder. If that's you, I invite you to book a complimentary breakthrough call where we can lift up the hood on your business, look at what's working, what's not working, where you're at now, where you want to take your business. And if we can help, help you take your business to the next level with our proven systems, we'll show you what that looks like. If not, frankly, we'll be the first to advise you to pass on our services. Either way, you will leave that call with massive value, massive clarity. Chances are we're going to have some fun.
So if that sounds meaningful and worthwhile to you, and it definitely should, I invite you to book a call at mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. Again, that's mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. Book a call. This is not a sales call. It's a clarity call. If we have to sell you to create a breakthrough in your business, frankly, you're not ready to create a breakthrough in your business. So we're not here to sell you. We're here to shine the light of truth on your situation to see if we can help you. So if you're open to having a meaningful conversation and really just shine the light of truth in your situation so that we can see if we can help you, book a call at mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. So that's all we got for today, friends. I trust you got some insight, some valuable new perspective on how to turn these problems into opportunities in your business and to use them to propel you higher, not to make you bitter, but to make you better. That these problems now can be an opportunity for you to build the muscle that you need to become the best version of yourself, to become the best leader you can be so you can stand on top of your dream and make it real. My name is Doran Aldana. Coming at you from the Art of Mortgage Marketing podcast. Be blessed. We'll see you on the next episode. Peace, y'all.